So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Neil Fleun. I'm CEO and founder, co-founder of Netronome, along with Johan that's down there that you'll hear a lot about from today. Um, you know, as I always say, uh, there's the brains and the brawn. So um, I think it goes without saying um, which lies where. Um, the critical uh, thing that I wanted to just firstly start off is thank everybody for being here today. Um, hopefully, it's going to be a useful and informative day for everybody. Um, and Sujal will handle more of the uh, detailed thanks. I would just like to also thank um, the, our co-sponsors, Barefoot Networks, that also believe in programmable networks, just like we do, and take it from there. So, without much more ado, um, I'm not going to talk extensively about um, just our products or anything like that. That's not the objective, um, because we're looking at this as a much more general issue in the industry. Um, I'm going to cover two particular aspects here that are generally um, important in the industry. The first one is going to take about five seconds, because I think most of us wouldn't be here if we did not believe in that first aspect. And then the second one that I'll talk um, more about is just some of the silicon aspects, specifically around what's happening in, in the silicon domain, because a lot of people here today would typically be more focused or coming, coming at the issue from a programming perspective rather than the silicon. But the silicon is obviously what everything has to run on. If we don't have silicon to run on, we can't really program it. So it is important to get some perspective in that light too. So first and foremost, the first issue, programmable networks. I think hopefully everybody around the, around the room here will agree that that genie is out of the bottle. We, do not, we cannot go back to building fixed function hardware um, ever again. That's just not going to fly anywhere for many, many reasons. And I'm 100% sure that there's many more people around the table, or I shouldn't say around the table, in this room that um, have a lot more data and use cases and everything else than I, even I have at this point in time to validate that that is the case. So going back is not an option. Um, but there's obviously the rapid, rapid evolution that has to happen within, within this environment. So. If we start looking at now what do the processors, what do the environments, what do the switches, and everything else that forms part of the ecosystem within a network, and what do they have to apply um, in order to be feasible? So this is on the second point. We have to look at the aspect of Moore's law. Now, I have a diagram up here, which I think is a core part of this discussion. Um, and just to explain it a little bit better, um, the graph um, at there, and this was published, it's uh, based on uh, Lindley Group data and it was published by The Economist a couple of years ago. And um, obviously there's a, at that point in time, it's quite controversial because some companies was, were opposing it, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's become generally accepted in the uh, in the silicon part of the industry. And this is that once we went over the hump, 28, 20 nanometers, um, in the feature sizes of, of the transistors. So to just put it in context, because not everybody here is necessarily going to be up to speed, the latest processors from Intel are typically manufactured in 14 nanometer which I don't think is even on the slide yet, if I remember correctly. Um, it, it only has 16. But I think this is a general industry slide that we're looking at here, rather than specific to any particular company. The critical issue is, is that at 28, a transistor is cheaper than a transistor at 16 nanometers based on the diagrams that we see here. Now, what is the implications of that? That fundamentally means that you could build um, a processor which has exactly the same performance, no difference in performance, 
at 28 nanometer cheaper than what you can build exactly the same processor at 14 or 16, whatever the, the, next, the key next node is. That is a very important fact because I will be very blunt and honest. Um, over the last six weeks, I've been to a number of different conferences. And at least three occasions, people that should know a lot better were saying that, oh, everything's going to change in the next five to 10 years because, and one of the key drivers is Moore's Law. So if there's nothing else that anybody takes away from this discussion here, Moore's Law is dead. It's deceased. It's buried. It's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. And if I have to paraphrase Monty Python, like in the parrot sketch, it is nailed to its perch. Uh, so, 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 um, that is an extremely important aspect, and it means that we have to look at what and what are the new architectures, and how are we going to make all of these different things work. I want to just give you some examples. So I, this is extremely unscientific and was based on me just go Googling a few things last night. Um, and I looked at 2007, first sort of generation of the Nahalem processors, because if we, if we talk about x86, at the Nahalem processors where we moved away from the front side bus to the, to the integrated memory controllers, that made a big, big difference in the performance specifically of IO-rich applications um, in the x86 line of processors. So if you draw the performance curve, it sort of looks like that with the Nahalem processors. And then largely right through to Skylake, it's not, there's not a substantial difference in performance on a per core basis. So if you look at it at a per core basis rather than the total processor, the, the benefits are not very great. So it makes sense to actually just compare that. So an E5420, which is the, in, the, in the Westmere range, if I remember correctly, um, at 2.5 gigahertz with four cores, with 12 megabytes of um, cache, um, in 2007 was priced at $316. In other words, if you translate that, into a per core price, it was $79 per core, and you roughly had three megabytes of cash per core. So, so, and that was priced, so it's $79 per core in that sort of time frame. Where we are today, and once again, very unscientific, and I'm sure that there's other areas, because all I did was to just go pick something which is roughly in the same uh, frequency range, um, and roughly in the same cash, per core aspect was the, uh, um, now I've just, I printed it out so small that I can't quite see. Uh, it's the ES2597 um, uh, V4, which is the latest as well, has well processors, which has 16 cores, 16 real cores, not the virtual cores. Um, 16 real cores at 2.6 gigahertz and it has 40 megabytes of cache. In other words, if you divide that down to the core perspective, that's about two and a half megabytes per core of cash. And um, the price for the chip is $2,891. So on a per core basis, that's $180 per core. So whether this is due to the demise of Moore's Law or not, there could be a lot of commercial as aspects to this. Fundamentally, on a per instruction basis, you are paying more per core today than what you were in 2007. Now, there's obviously been some performance increases, but I think hopefully most of us will agree that it's probably not doubled um, over that period of time. So the only reason for using it as a very unscientific illustration is that just relying on Moore's law and more cores and it's going to be cheaper is a very slippery slope for each and every one of us looking at programmable networks. So, and I want to be very clear that that it does not mean that it's bad or anything like that. That's not the issue. The issue is we have to think about our system architectures and how we make those system architectures work. So 
to just give you then some further examples in terms of the trends and the needs, I don't think I need to tell anybody around the table here that we are seeing speeds in the network increase continuously. We're talking 10 gig, 25 gig, 40 gig, 50 gig, 100 gig in many different locations. So if you compare that with a 10% increase in performance, 20% increase in performance, it just doesn't keep up. So once again, that points us to having to do things better and to do things in a different way to what we have thought about things in the past. And the, once again, we said programmable networks, the genie's out, we can never go back to putting the genie back in the bottle. That ain't gonna happen. So we have to find the solutions. So one of the areas that allows us to keep scaling in this way, and it's a very, very key area for many companies across many different product segments at the moment, is the question of adding application-specific coprocessors to your x86 environment. So some of these are taken as a given today, um, such as, for example, graphics processors. I don't think anybody's going to try to use their general purpose processor to, to play in COD or whatever at this point in time anymore. I don't think that's, that's going to happen. That's a classic example of an application-specific coprocessor to your general purpose processors. In a similar way, DSPs get used for all forms of transcoding in conjunction with your general purpose processors, et cetera, in many different embedded applications. Um, FPGAs, uh, FPGAs have always been used in the networking space. FPGAs, um, you know, fundamentally, Intel acquired Altera a couple of years ago, or a year ago about, um, specifically around making more uh, co-processing available via the, via the FPGAs. Um, and then obviously one of our co-sponsors is an example of, um, uh, in the form of Barefoot Networks, of more programmable switches um, and the ability to actually control the switches through P4 code. All of these things are out there today. The one, of course, that touches then each and every one of us around the table here is the SmartNICs. Um, and it's not just, we're not the only purveyor of a SmartNIC. But in the same way that you needed graphics processors to do graphics in conjunction with your server, um, you essentially need SmartNICs to go with your um, x86 coprocessors. And that's obviously a view that uh, we have. Um, there's other ways to solve the problem. But I think the critical part of the equation here is just that we have to do things to look at new architectures, new software architectures, hardware architectures, and ways and means to solve the problem. Um, this is therefore a very active area of, of um, research, I think, for everybody. And um, there's going to be a lot of exciting things. And at the end of the day, all of that needs to be reprogrammed. And the programming models and aspects of that which will be under discussion today, I think would be relevant to all of the different ways of solving the problem. And I think that's the, that's the key message we would like to get across. So in summary, if there's one thing I can uh, just leave with all of you is that Moore's Law in its general form, in other words, which is typically stated as you're going to get twice the performance for half the price or in a few years' time, or at least for the same price. Um, that is dead. That does not exist anymore. Um, and if that's the only thing you remember from this discussion, um, that would be very useful. So thanks very much to everybody. And um, if you want any more detail on a lot of, lot of the more detailed aspects, um, to the extent that I can talk about it, because obviously we're not allowed to talk about a lot of the, the details about, around silicon, um, we would be, I would be more than happy to take some questions in that regard. So, John.